attempting this just to sparse recovery to introduce it as a different variant of this problem. So remember that in sparse recovery, we really thought about some optimization problem that uh, we wanted to solve, which is non-convex in general, where we were given the basis, namely A, so we want to use the columns of A to sparsely represent some given signal, and we're also given the example. And what we wanted to solve was we wanted to solve the following optimization problem. Min over, find the sparsest x that solves a given linear system. So the crucial things that we talked about, so this was the idealized optimization problem we wanted to solve. It's uh, you know, hard to solve in this way because it's non convex but there were some really important special cases where indeed we could solve this optimization problem through a proxy by either trying to find the smallest L1 norm solution that satisfies it, or by directly doing some sort of pursuit, you know, greedy pursuit algorithm, which we talked about. So we use the relaxation, which provably does find the optimal solution under conditions like when A, is full column rank. So if anyone would remind me when A is full column rank, how we solve this optimization problem? You just ignore it. You ignore the sparsity, exactly. You know, B has to be in the column span of A in order for there to be a solution. Uh, otherwise, there is no solution, and then you just take the pseudo inverse of A, and that is your X. And its sparsity is the best you can do, ignoring sparsity entirely. But there are other more interesting cases. You know, when A is incoherent. This is when we used, for example, orthogonal matching pursuit to be able to find a sparse solution, a planted sparse solution. So we assumed that B was itself equal to A times X hat, where X hat was sparse, about root n sparse. And in that case, we could greedily pick off the support of x hat and then solve the linear system in the case where a is incoherent. And then what I alluded to at the end and told you at least about the main results are, for example, when a is RIP, when it satisfies the restricted isometry property, that's a setting in which you can actually have sparse recovery guarantees even up to nearly linear sparsity. So if you think about you know, the planted solution as being k-sparse, the number of rows you need in A will be about K log N over K. So those were the three most important cases where you really can solve this optimization problem, at least by proxy, by solving some sort of L1 minimization or something else. Now, uh, sparse coding is going to be a different setting where we don't actually know the basis. So if you think about uh, you know, uh, the examples we talked about, what we were really saying was that when we have a signal which is k-sparse, there are situations in which we can measure it much more concisely, take many fewer than n measurements, something on the order of k measurements, and still be able to solve the inverse problem. Now, there are other settings, you know, this happens sort of throughout signal processing, that in other cases, natural signals, well, they just happen to be, turn, they turn out to be sparse in the correctly chosen basis. So if you think about like Logan's phenomenon where he was you know, broadcasting these uh, uh, band-limited signals along a channel, but they were subject to sparse corruptions, that's a setting where he had a physical model for the channel. And what it led to was the spikes in science dictionary, which was a basis in which his observed signal was believed to be sparse. Now, there are other, other settings, and for example, uh, you know, signal processing, where you actually have to do a lot of work to hand design what the right dictionary is so that your observed signal is you know, sparse, right? So let me you know, tell you a little bit about that. So for example, you know, more broadly, throughout signal processing, 
Well, let me write these out. So this is sort of one of the key observations that drives a lot of the work in signal processing, is the idea that uh, you know finding the right basis to represent signals is not particular just to Logan's phenomena with spikes and signs, but is really a more broad phenomenon that lots of different signals you consider, whether they're images or audio signals or what have you, that if you can hand design what is the right basis then it gives you ways to manipulate and denoise these signals in interesting ways. So in contrast, you know, sparse coding is really about the question of do you need to do this work to hand design? What's the right basis each different type of data type you work with? Or can you automatically do it? So that'll be the type of question we're interested in. But just to give you an idea about uh, you know, how much broader this goes for choosing the right basis in signal processing, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down uh, various bases that have a name, but I'm going to put in a fake one, and you guys have to guess which one of these is not actually a set of wavelengths. So we'll play a game show. One of these is not a wavelet family. Can anyone guess which one's not a wavelet family? It's a fun game. Huh? I know, right? I definitely wouldn't trick you by putting something that sounds fake but is real up there, right? No, I'd probably do that. Any votes? No, triplet is real. <laughs> that was the planted one that's actually real. Filter light is fake, I think. <laughs> See, that was my attempt to make something that sounds legitimate. <laughs> but the rest of them are actually real things. So actually, for example, curvelets are a really big deal for um, you know, representing different types of edges and images that other types of wavelets did not before. There's a huge, rich statistical theory about you know, the types of min-max rates they achieve. I mean, each one of these actually has a really long story about you know, why it's the right thing for different families. And so sparse coding is going to ask you know, qualitatively, can we automatically design what are the right types of bases? So I'm going to formulate the you know, probabilistic model. So first I'll cast it just as an optimization problem, the same way that we cast sparse recovery as an optimization problem. But in order to have any hope of being able to solve this problem, you know, all of the types of assumptions that we needed for sparse recovery, we're definitely going to need for sparse coding. In fact, we'll need even more assumptions beyond that. But that's OK, because the cases where you really want to solve sparse, you know, sparse coding are only cases where the learned dictionary is something that you can then use for sparse recovery later on. So that's fine. Right? So let me define sparse coding informally. So this is what you should take as your qualitative definition of this problem.
All right, so you know, this is the qualitative question. Now, instead of A as being given, what we're going to think about is we're going to have many different examples, B1 to Bp. Now, these are things which, if I just gave you one example, of course you could find a dictionary that enables it, you know, allows a sparse representation, because you would just choose an A that puts the example explicitly in B. Right? But we're going to be much more interested in settings where you're given tons of examples. And the goal is to find some common structure between them that you want to figure out what are the you know, elements in A that you should put in there that can be used in common for all of these different examples, B1 through BP. And you know, already you can see, even from the way I've qualitatively described this question, that all of the issues that happen with sparse recovery are going to arise here, all of the computational issues. Remember that sparse recovery, when you don't make an assumption on A, is NP hard. So we talked about this by showing, for example, that uh, it's hard to determine whether a set of points is in general position. And we use that to give a reduction that actually this optimization problem, in the worst case, is actually hard to solve. So if you think about sparse coding, well, we're taking one layer beyond that is we don't even know A. And you know, the, the, rec uh, the recovery problem itself for A can be hard, so we're going to have to assume away all of those problems. But let me phrase uh, sparse coding now as an optimization problem. And then we'll talk about how to think about the right model where this problem can be easy. So usually the way sparse coding is cast is as a non-convex optimization problem. <coughs> So maybe the first way you can think about formalizing this is you just try and minimize some bound k on the sparsity. So you want the property that there is an A, which itself is some matrix in n by n. So you're constraining it to have at most n columns. And you want the property that So I'll use the superscript with parentheses to denote you know, which example. So I have examples bi for 1 to p. And I want that I really do have a solution to this linear system. So this is my basis. This is my representation. And I want the property that for all of these xi's, each one of them is k sparse. So this just asks the question, you know, is there a set of n columns so that, and a set of representations so that every example I'm given has a k-sparse representation. That's what this problem asks. So very simple. So does this version of the problem make sense? Right? So oftentimes you'll actually, you know, this already has the issue that you're asking for an exact solution to this, um, to this linear system. And, uh, but a lot of times a different version of sparse coding still is a non-convex optimization problem is to instead of enforcing um, you know, exact equality, to just make them be close to each other. So this will actually be the version of it which we usually think about, is we can think about casting it instead as we, win, we want to minimize over you know, A and the X sub I, so all of the different representations. We want to minimize some sum from I equals 1 to P, because there are P examples, of A times XI minus B of I. And then we're going to add some penalty term, which is going to be used to enforce sparsity. So this, a lot of times, this term is usually called the reconstruction. So this is each of my examples. I don't need them to be to satisfy exact equality, but I want them to be very close. And this is how much I'm left over with each of my examples. <coughs> And this is some sort of very nonlinear penalty function. You can think about this L function. There are many choices that people use in practice. Now you can think about this penalty function as being you know, any function which is much higher for dense vectors and is lower for sparse vectors. 
in a lot of our cases, it'll actually be easiest just to think about L as a hard sparsity constraint. Where L of X equals you know, infinity if X has at least A plus one non-zeros and otherwise is zero. So it's just something that explicitly precludes dense enough things. Uh, a lot of times people really, you know, this is an extremely non-convex optimization problem. So there are a lot of tricks people try about putting in different nonlinear penalty functions, smoother ones, just because the heuristics seem to do better. But there's a lot of empirical evidence that if you really could solve this type of optimization problem, it would do even better than putting in a smoother constraint. So but this will be one of the ways that we think about this problem. And one of the things that I want you to notice, so does this optimization problem make sense? Are there any questions about the second one? So, sorry, is there a question? Yep. So one of the things I want to emphasize is that, you know, we've talked about this a few times, that there are things like alternating minimization. So you remember even back to non-negative matrix factorization, where we have these types of quadratic constraints, where we have M, which is given, which is entry-wise non-negative, and we want to write it as the product of A times W, either exactly or approximately. And we had this issue that because both A and W were unknown, that meant that we really have quadratic constraints. But alternating minimization was the approach of guessing you know, one of the two factors, optimizing over the other. You know, given A, find the W, which is entry-wise non-negative, so that A times W is as close as possible to M. And then treating W as fixed and alternating over A. So we would go back and forth in this way. So the same way we can think about this type of optimization problem is something which we could solve if we were given one of the two factors. So if I gave you A, and it really was an incoherent, you know, it was the correct <laughs> basis, and it was incoherent, then each of these examples we would just be solving a sparse recovery problem. We'd be asking to find you know, a k-sparse solution that, let's say, hopefully exactly equals uh, bi. But similarly, if we were given all of the different representations, and they were the true representations, and we were given enough of them, then we could solve a least squares problem to get a very good estimate for a. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to prove that uh, alternating minimization types of approaches actually do work for these optimization problems. So this will be one of the first cases we see in this class. We'll come back to this theme later when we talk about matrix completion, but where we actually show that these uh, you know, heuristics are not really heuristics, that with the right probabilistic model, you really can reason about when and why they work. So that'll be our goal. Uh, so this is actually pretty recent work. But um, let's see. So what I want to describe right now, I mean, I'll get into that when we talk about sparse coding, uh, there's actually a lot of biological motivations for this problem. So I'll describe this later on. That actually the origins of these problems actually came from neuroscience. So we'll care about not only are there optimization problems, you know, are there algorithms that proofly solve this type of optimization problem under the right condition. We'll actually care about whether or not these are neurally plausible things that you know, the visual cortex could conceivably accomplish, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Was there a question? No? All right, so let me describe the generative model now. So this will be really what we work with. <coughs> so there'll be some unknown. Dictionary A, which will be, you know, M by N, and A itself will be incoherent. And each of our examples, you know, B1 to BP, we're going to be thinking of it as being generated from the right stochastic model. So, you know, the same way that we talked about sparse recovery, we had to plant a, a solution, you know, a B, which really does have a K sparse solution. The same way in each of our examples, we're going to plant that it really does have a case for our solution in this basis. So the most natural way to do this is we can choose p examples for i equals 1 to p for each one of them. What we're going to do is we're going to choose where it's non-zero. 
that we're going to choose some set S. And the simplest way to do this to prevent you know, all of the details from becoming overbearing, we're just going to choose the set uniformly at random so that it has size k. So we choose a random size k set. This will be the support, the hidden support of the example we're given. And then also to make things easy is, you know, for each of the coordinates in x, so these are the non-zeros in x that we need to set, let's keep things simple and let's set xj of i to be plus 1 with probability of half, and to be minus 1 otherwise, and independent. And then we just output b of i equals a times x i. So this is our model. So does the model make sense? Are there any questions about it? Very simple model, hidden incoherent basis. So it is a basis which, if we knew it, each of the examples we're given b sub i, we actually could solve the sparse recovery problem. So that's good, because the only bases that will be useful to learn are things that we can do things with later on, like solve sparse recovery problems. And we're going to explicitly plant the case sparse solution. We do it the most natural way possible. We choose its support uniformly at random and condition on its support, we put in random plus minus ones. Okay. So I want to mention a sort of important caveat that this is a really stripped down version of the types of generative models you would actually care about. So you remember that uh, you know, when we talked about tensor decompositions, we talked about independent component analysis. That was a setting where there was some hidden, uh, there was some hidden basis A. And what we were given was we're given A times X, you know, many of those examples, but with the property that each of the coordinates of X is independent. So this sounds almost the same because the coordinates aren't independent. You know, whether or not a coordinate is non-zero influences the probability another coordinate is non-zero. But even then, conditioned on their support, they're conditionally independent. So one of the things I want to caution you with is that this is the simplest model to think about this problem. And actually, the algorithms I'll talk about will all extend to settings where things are not exactly independent. But, you know, for example, you would need that each of the supports have or size at most k and that things like the probability two entries are non-zero should not be too much larger than what they would be in this model. So all of the algorithms are actually not going to be as brittle as the types of algorithms we gave for independent component analysis. So that really is an important caveat to this. But let's keep things simple and let's work with this model. OK? So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tell you what the algorithm is that we're going to analyze. We're not really going to, we're going to analyze it, we're going to finish it up tomorrow. Uh, sorry, um, Thursday. But, um, you know, what I want to do today is I want to show you what the algorithm is. And I want to introduce you to some of the tools we're going to use to analyze it. Because, you know, the key point in all of this, if I, you know, want you to take away one thing from this analysis is, you know, how in the world are you going to analyze some heuristic for trying to solve this nonlinear optimization problem, right? This problem is certainly really, really hard in the worst case. It captures all sorts of hard sparse recovery problems and even worse things than that. And, you know, this is a known non-convex function. It's non-convex because both A and the X's are unknown. The way that we're actually going to analyze it is via sort of cute change in perspective. So instead of thinking about gradient descent and altering minimization as trying to make progress on this non-convex function, we're actually going to think about an unknown convex function. So imagine instead of unknown A and unknown X, what if I plugged in the true X's? You know, whatever the true representations are, that then would be a convex optimization problem, which gradient descent really would reach the optimum. So instead of saying that gradient descent and all optimization make progress on this known non-convex function, we're just going to show that they approximate gradient descent on an unknown convex function, which we don't have access to. 
So that's the main idea, is I'm gonna state the algorithm now, you know, the thing which we're gonna analyze. But for the rest of today, what we're really gonna do is we're gonna develop the tools for reasoning about gradient descent and approximate gradient descent. And this is, I think, a very different view than usual in optimization, because in a lot of optimization, you care about, you know, you have some known convex function, which you have, let's say, oracle access to, and you want to prove that simple procedures really do reach the optimal, things like gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. But in learning, the types of problems you actually study are not actually nice in that they're convex, but you can still hope that in the right generative model, they're in some reasonable way close enough to convex that simple iterative schemes really do work. So I think this is, you know, in the time since I last taught this course a year and a half ago, this is something which has really emerged that people have developed a lot of insights about how to analyze alternate optimization in various settings. And one of the things I really want to emphasize is the sort of hope to create a unified view as alternating optimization makes progress because of its approximate gradient descent. So let me state the algorithm now. So I guess I'll need just a few simple definitions first. So I'll let threshold of a half just be the following function. Very simple. So for coordinates which, uh, for any value which is less than a half an absolute value, it's set to zero. Otherwise, it keeps it preserved. And we'll also interpret threshold a half of some vector y coordinate wise. where we just apply this function to each of the different coordinates. Now we'll do the same thing for the sine function. I'm just introducing these definitions so we can state the uh, algorithm very succinctly. So we'll let sine of y, as usual, just be plus one if y is positive, zero if y is zero, minus one otherwise. And similarly, we'll take the coordinate y sine of various vectors. Now with these in mind, I'm going to give you a very simple algorithm for solving this optimization problem under this generative model. So here's the algorithm. So we'll assume that we're given some a hat, which will need some suitable initialization. This is sort of always a quirk of alternate minimization. We'll see this again when we talk about matrix completion, that uh, we'll always be able to prove alternate minimization works given a close enough starting point. And what I'll give you later is there actually are algorithms for getting a good enough starting point that you can then run this algorithm. But it always has this quirk that alternate minimization things that people propose, they seem to work from random initializations and from very dumb initializations. But the provable methods we have all need somewhat smart initializations. And they need to be close enough to the right answer that they really do make progress. So I think that's a big open question is trying to understand why they work, even from very cold starts instead of from lukewarm starts. But in any case, what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the following t times. We'll draw q fresh samples, so we're going to batch this process. Let me let these fresh samples be b1 to bq. And what we're going to do is we're going to, for each of them, set x hat i. So this is our <laughs> estimate of the representation given our current dictionary. We're going to set it just to be equal to the coordinate wise threshold of a hat transpose times bi. So that's it. You're given some example bi. And remember that incoherent dictionaries are ones which are somewhat close to being orthogonal, that you know, they preserve things like the norm of a vector. So you can think about just taking its inner product with each of the b sub i's 
as a rough estimate of which coordinates are zero and which ones are non zero. Now you have the issue that even if bi was one sparse, and there's only one column in A that's actually on, and you have an estimate A hat that's somewhat close to A, then you can imagine that when you take this matrix vector multiplication, you'll have one entry which is large, and the others will be small because there'll be some bleed over into those other inner products. And so what this threshold is trying to do is it's just trying to recover you know, not necessarily what are the right values for those coordinates, which are on, but at least recover its support, which ones are on and which ones are off. And what we're going to do then is we're going to use these supports to actually update our dictionary. So the way that we do that is we then set our new estimate a hat to be equal to the old a hat, plus we're going to move in some direction which is given by the following simple expression. All we do is we take bi, we subtract a hat, x hat of i. That's our residual error. And now what we do is we multiply by the coordinate wise sign of x hat of i transpose. So that'll be our algorithm, right? All we do, we take our residual error, uh, given what our current representation is in our current dictionary. And then what we do is we multiply it by, we take its outer product with the coordinate y sine of x hat. And that gives us a matrix, which we then use to update a hat. And this is often called the step size of gradient descent. So what we'll need is we'll need that the step size is small enough, and that q is large enough, that this is a good estimate for its empirical expectation. And we're going to prove that this algorithm really does work from uh, a good enough starting condition A hat. So are there any questions about this algorithm? Yeah? Just to clarify, that's entry-wise direction, entry-wise sign. Exactly. Exactly. Because what's going on here is I have this uh, m-dimensional vector, which is my example. I'm multiplying it by a hat transpose, so that's an n by m matrix. And all I'm doing is I'm using this coordinate wise to figure out roughly which things are positive, which things are negative, and which things are zero. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to use this following update rule. It turns out that this is actually uh, a variant of the types of rules that have been suggested in neuroscience. In neuroscience, though, the Olshausen and Field rule actually just has the slight difference that it doesn't take this coordinate wise sign here. It actually multiplies it by x hat by transpose. But this will actually be a much simpler one to analyze. You can analyze either one. Just because in our settings, you'll actually get this correct, like its support will be correct. And then you'll only have to deal with errors that are linear that are in this term, instead of having contributions to the error from both sides and dealing with a lot of quadratic terms. But this will be a simpler one to analyze. Uh, any other questions about this rule? Yep. So is T something that we specify at the beginning of the algorithm, or are we going to have to, how do we come up with T to say that we come up with some optimum there? Oh, OK. So this, in general, will just get close to the right answer. So we're going to see in each phase how it's going to make progress column-wise. So what we really care about is we have some target solution, A. And we're close enough with a hat that there is a pretty good matching you know, between the columns of a hat and the columns of a. Think about these things as being like 1 over log n close. So they're not really inverse poly close. What we're going to show is that each one of those columns under these rules makes geometric progress. So you can actually drive the error down to some sort of inverse poly group. So this is actually a really important qualitative point. I'm not sure it'll be completely clear at this point. but. You know, these types of non-convex optimization problems, you know, the fact that heuristics do well, there's a lot of mystery in play here. Because if you think about the true solution, you know, if I gave you the true A in here, then, you know, finding the best X will be close to, you know, the true X and vice versa. So you can think that around the true solution, locally, it really does look convex. But a lot of times, you need to be extremely close to the right answer, like 1 over inverse poly, to really show that the function behaves convex in that region. 
And what we're actually going to show is that these types of iterative schemes work in domains where they're only somewhat close to the right answer. So instead of being like 1 over n to the 100 close column lines, so the true A, they'll only be like 1 over log n close or something like that. So they'll be in a very medium and weak range where they'll still make geometric progress nevertheless. And that's because this simple rule will estimate, will be a good approximation to the idealized direction you'd like to move in. So that's the sense in which what we really want to do is we want to prove that each step of this behaves like approximate gradient descent. Yep. Here we're going to need the step to step size based on things like t and the other parameters of our problem in order to have guarantees for this. So I'm leaving it unfixed for the time being. And what you'll really need is you'll need it to be small enough. So you think about it as like, you know, if I'm at some, we'll see this when we talk about gradient descent in a few minutes. But, you know, if I'm aiming for some target solution, you know, even if I knew the convex function, I took the gradient, I'd never want to take an arbitrarily long, you know, step size. I want it to be based on, you know, an estimate of how far off I am from, you know, the true solution. Because I don't want to spend all this time overshooting. So a lot of times the guarantees you get are for, you know, eta small enough that you're making progress in the right direction. And then there are usually ways to choose eta in a way that you optimize how many steps you need to take. So that you make enough progress, but you don't overshoot too much. Do you have a uh, question? So these EI yeah, are different from those that we're planning, right? These what? The, the, these the, the EIs are different from those, right? Like, <coughs> no, these are the EIs. Oh, the yeah, plans. yeah. Okay. So all I'm doing is to avoid you know, indexing funny superscripts. I'm just saying each time you need fresh samples. <coughs> so I'm just going to take fresh samples from this model, one through Q of them, and then I take Q plus one to two Q, and then I take the next set and so okay. on. But it'll just be because uh, we don't want to consider issues of how the error interacts between the different phases. And it'll be easier to think about it as a fresh set of error based on sampling in each phase. Yeah? So, just, uh, so here we are assuming that in our final solution, our XIs will never have entries between 0 and 1. Yes, so that's a property of our plot. Oh, okay. Yes. So that's an important thing. This is another important caveat. So I mentioned that you know, all of these generative models can, you know, the algorithms will still work, even if S is not uniformly random, even if these are not plus minus one. But the proof I'm going to give you really does require that non-zeros are noticeably larger than the zero, you know, than the small coefficients and the noise that you can tolerate. So you know, the proofs that you can put in things like Gaussians for the non-zeros are much, much more involved, and they require a very different style of analysis. So that's kind of an unappealing feature of the proofs that I'm going to tell you. Are there any other questions about this? It's good you guys have lots of questions about this, because I think conceptually this is one of the more challenging you know, topics we do, uh, is analyzing altering minimization. Yep. Why is uh, A, A hat B, B, I a good approximation of this part? Yeah. So let's do the following thought experiment. Right? So A is an incoherent dictionary. Now, what if A hat is like you know, 1 over log n plus? Now, I'll state this more precisely when we talk about it next time in you know, lecture. But if you think about you know, A hat as being something that's column wise close, and let's just do the thought experiment where B, I. You know, what if the XI that generated it is one sparse? So all it's doing is picking a particular column, let's say A1, out of A, and that's what B, B1 is. Now, when you take that A1 and you take its inner product with each of the columns in A hat, well, by virtue of those columns in A hat being somewhat close to their counterparts in A, you're actually going to get a large value when you take its inner product with the first column in A hat, and you're going to get a somewhat small value for all of the others because they're close to their counterpart, which is incoherent with that given column. So in general, what we'll have is that when you take this type of inner product, you know, by virtue of our generative model, some of the coordinates will be large and some will be small and you know, we'll have large absolute value. And those are ones which, with confidence, you can say really are in the support. And all the other things with high probability will be things that are not in the support. 
So we'll use things like the fact that the non-zeros are independent random variables that you know the random variable which is the noise which corrupts you know where the you know what the entries are in the center product will itself be concentrated and that'll allow us to deal with about root n sparsity in these types of sparse coding algorithms. Any other questions about this? All right, so the way you know that I alluded to that we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it through approximate gradient descent. So what I want to do right now is I want to do a little bit of a boot camp about gradient descent. Uh, and then next lecture, we're actually going to connect it back to this algorithm. But this is the plan for where we're going. We want to analyze this and that generative model. So let me do a little bit of a boot camp in um, approximate gradient descent. Okay, so the so the you know there are entire courses on you know gradient descent and convex optimization methods, but I want to give you what are the most important parts of this for our purposes, especially. So the usual version of you know, gradient descent is that suppose we are given Oracle access. some convex function. Now there's an entire literature on you know, how do you actually try and minimize uh, this convex function. And there are a lot of different variants, right? Because even if I give you Oracle access to some convex function, you can think about the variant of is it unconstrained minimization or are you trying to minimize it over all of space? Or is it constrained minimization or are you trying to minimize it over a convex set? Uh, you can also think about many different variants on what properties on this function you have. So in general, the stronger properties you have on it, the nicer guarantees you get for how many iterations you need to get close to the right answer. You know, one of the most basic conditions you need on this function is in order to have any sort of reasonable guarantees, you need to assume that it's at least Lipschitz. If it's not Lipschitz, then you really don't know how to take your step size, and there really could be some minimum that's just hiding there that you just can't see until you take tons and tons of small step sizes and all of a sudden see some, you know, hugely decreasing function. So the bare minimum constraints that you need are things like Lipschitz. Then there are stronger conditions, like you'll hear of, for example, strongly convex functions, which are in some sense approximated upper and lower bounded by quadratic functions. And there are also things like smooth functions that have you know, guarantees about what the Hessian looks like in terms of its eigenvalues. So I'll state some of the weakest guarantees we know for, um, for gradient descent and some of the strongest guarantees, but they'll need incomparable constraints on the underlying function. So uh, the other point that I want to make is that for our purposes, we're actually going to assume we have access to the gradient of f of x, so we know which direction to move in. In general, you can remove some of these types of guarantees by, you know, wherever you are, you can sort of take some sampling of the neighborhood of f of x to try and estimate its gradient, and then use that as your direction of progress. But let's just assume that our oracle even tells us what this gradient is. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to assume that. Uh, f of x is twice differentiable. And I want to emphasize that to prove the types of theorems that I'm going to prove, you don't actually need to assume that, such a strong condition. But it'll make the proofs much easier, because then we can actually talk about the Hessian. And it won't be as hard to sort of prove the types of inequalities we need. So the usual approach now is just uh, gradient descent. And how does this work? Well, all we do is we do t iterations. 
I'll label them as 0 to t minus 1 just for some notational convenience. And what we do is we set x t plus 1 equal to x t. And then we move in the direction of the gradient at the current point. So this is gradient descent. And we have all the usual caveats that, you know, depending on the properties of our function that we're invoking, that'll tell us how we should set the step size. And all of our theorems will tell us for some choice of settings of the step size and for some properties of the function, these are the number of steps we need to get close enough to the optimum. But this is the basic you know, pattern which you did. Okay? So very simple. Makes sense? All right, so let's do it. So you know, one of the key properties that you can use of this function is Lipschitz. So let me state that. We'll say that f is L Lipschitz. And we'll always be interested in um, unconstrained optimization. So in general, if you think about constrained optimization, where you're trying to minimize this function f of x on some convex domain, then in general, what you need to do is this step size can take you outside of the domain, and you need to project back into your domain. That's actually one of the more computationally expensive parts about gradient descent is actually the projection step. That projection can actually be very involved depending on what the set is you're projecting into. If I were trying to minimize some convex function on some ball, then projection is very easy because I just scale down whatever my point is until it's unit norm. But if you think about projecting onto things like the simplex or general polytopes, it can get very involved. And that actually can be a convex program in its own way. So there's a whole theory to sort of how to do convex optimization in a constrained way without projections. And that's an entirely different theory in its own right. So I just want to mention that for posterity. But in any case, we're going to say f is L Lipschitz if uh, the norm of the gradient is always at most L for any point. So very simple definition. Uh, this certainly implies things like you know, that for any points, uh, the magnitude of f of x minus f of y is upper bounded by L times um, the norm of x minus y. That's fine. And now the main you know, theorem that you can get if you just have conditions like Lipschitz behavior is you can prove things like the following. So you always need some sort of bound on how far you are from the optimal solution in Euclidean distance to start off with. This is just the diameter of my you know, possible set of things I'm considering. Then it turns out what you can prove is that f of 1 over t sum t equals 1 to capital T of xt minus f of x star. So x star is the optimum, so this is always you know, non-negative uh, because this can't be better than the optimum. But you can prove that it's not too much worse, that it's at most r times L, so there you see that the diameter creeps up, and so does the Lipschitz property. But you get a square root of t type of convergence. If you choose, for example, eta equals r over L root t. So this is one of the theorems. I'm not going to prove this one. It's pretty simple. I'll put up online references to uh, Sebastian Bubeck's notes. He's at Princeton. He has really nice notes on these text topics. So if you want to see the proof of this, it's only a few lines, and you can check it out. Uh, the other point I want to make is that you know even here, one of the unappealing properties is that uh, the step size depends on the number of iterations that you want to do in total. So you have to decide how many iterations you want to do, and then you choose the step size. There are also variants where you can just choose a variable step size. When you're on the t -th iteration, you know, little t, you can instead choose this to be r over l times root of little t. And then you get the same types of convergence. So it's a step size which is changing and is getting smaller and smaller as you take more and more iterations. 
you'll get the same type of guarantee, but with extra logarithmic terms, so it's not a big deal. Uh, so these you should think of as the very weakest guarantees you can get for great, you know, the, the guarantees you can get for gradient descent in the weakest possible condition. Now let me tell you about some of the strongest possible conditions you can prove gradient descent for. So the strongest conditions, you know, need further properties on it. So we'll say that f is, I'll call it beta prime, because I'm going to use beta for something else later uh, for the condition I actually care about. We'll say that it's beta prime smooth if this now is, uh, I'll explain this in a second. So what's going on here is that we're taking the Hessian of f of x, so this is itself a matrix. And we're looking at the operator norm of this symmetric matrix. So smoothness just guarantees that uh, the operator norm of the Hessian is not too large. But you can think about this as really being a statement about, you know, it implies, for example, that uh, the gradient of f of x itself does not change too drastically. So it implies, for example, that the following Lipschitz-like condition holds for the gradient. Uh, so in fact, a lot of times you'll see smoothness defined this way. And you can get all the guarantees I talked about just to work with this weaker definition where you don't need to assume that f is twice differentiable. But again, it'll be easier for us to assume that it is, in which case I can just state smoothness this way in terms of the hash. So this is you know, one of the key properties, smoothness, that you need to get better guarantees. Uh, even from just smoothness alone, you can get better guarantees for gradient descent, but you still don't get geometric convergence. So if you think about R and L as being some constants here, then in order to get epsilon close to the right answer, I need to choose T to be one over epsilon squared. So it's polynomial convergence, but not geometric, which is uh, not as good as you could hope. So in fact, um, the other key definition, which together smoothness and strong convexity will give us those types of guarantees, is that we'll say that f is alpha prime strongly convex if the following type of condition holds. So we need that f of x minus f of y is at most gradient of f of x times x minus y minus alpha over 2 x minus y squared. So let me explain this you know, geometrically. So we have our convex function. You know, let's just choose you know, x squared for simplicity. Uh, that will always be the easiest thing to come to. So if we have that f of x equals x squared, then pictorially what's going on is imagine we have two points, you know, x and y, and then we can take the tangent line at x. And if you think about this, what this means is that the convexity of f implies that f of y is at least f of x plus the gradient of f of x transpose times y minus x. So you guys all see that this follows, for example, just from convexity that this inequality holds. It's just that this tangent line is a lower bound on the function. A lot of times, you know, you can even work with like subgradients, and this will still be true, is that you take any subgradient and take its inner product of the direction you're moving in, that plus the function value at the point you started from is a lower bound. So if you think about this, what this implies then is I pull the y over the other side, I pull this the other side and switch the order, and with alpha equals zero, this is just the statement of convexity. Now strong convexity just means that you actually do have some sort of quadratic behavior. So x squared is something which is strongly convex, but it tells you that in this inequality, which is always true for a convex function, I can even throw in a small quadratic term if I weight it appropriately and still have the inequality be true. 
So it tells you definitively how much more progress you make than just the gradient would tell you. So that's the idea for strong convexity. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? All right, so let me state the theorem for strong convexity now, and then we'll prove something. Although we'll prove something different. see in Hubeck's book. So let F be alpha prime strongly convex, beta prime smooth. Then xt plus 1 minus x star, the distance from these, squared is at most 1 minus alpha prime over beta prime with p plus 1. Oops. Yeah. Plus minus x0 minus x bar squared. So again, you need to choose the step size appropriately. So if you choose the step size to be based on the smoothness parameter, one over the smoothness parameter, then actually you get this geometric type of decrease in your distance. So that's the key property, is that based, you know, the, the more strongly convex it is, uh, the smaller the smoothness parameter, the better off you are. You get stronger and stronger geometric convergence, but even simple gradient descent works. So this is a theorem which we're actually going to sort of implicitly prove, is that you know a lot of times these uh, tools from convex optimization are really in settings where you assume you have access to the function. You know which direction to move in, that you have access to the gradient of the function. And actually in the settings we're interested in, this convex function that we want to optimize is something which is unknown. So that's a huge, huge, huge difference in repurposing the tools from convex optimization into learning, is that we won't have the property that we can just move in the gradient, but we'll just have to move in some direction which hopefully has non-trivial agreement with the direction you'd like to move in. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you even one further abstraction of strong convexity and smoothness. It won't be immediately obvious that it actually is implied by uh, strong convexity and smoothness, but let me just state it. I'll state a theorem and it will prove that theorem that we get geometric uh, convergence under those conditions. So the key definition which we're actually going to be working with is we're going to consider the following type of rule instead. So for t equals 0 to t minus 1, we'll do the same thing. We'll set uh, t plus 1 equal to xt minus eta times gt, but now this gt is not necessarily gradient of f of x t. Okay? So we're just going to consider some general rule, and you know, with a view towards all minimization, this will be one step of all minimization, which direction it moves. And we'll want to prove conditions on these directions that ensure that this really does reach some target point x star. So the key definition which we're going to use is we're going to use the following. We'll say that the vectors gt are alpha, beta, <coughs> epsilon t correlated so actually it'll be easier just to do epsilon here instead of this 
alpha, beta, epsilon correlated with x star. Yeah. GT is inner product with xt minus x star is at least alpha times xt minus x star squared plus beta gt squared minus epsilon. So think about it this way. You know, what's the perfect direction? You're trying to get to some point x star. What's the perfect direction to move in? Well, you're subtracting this a lot. So instead, what you would want is you'd want to move in the direction xt minus x star. Then you'd get that you're adding in x star minus xt, and you'd go all the way there in your first step. And what we want to show is just that if the direction you're moving in has some non-trivial inner product with the direction you'd like to be moving in, that for some alpha, this alpha can be quite small. It doesn't really matter. That this inner product is large compared to the norm of xt minus x star, the direction you'd like to move in, and the norm of gt itself. So I don't want you to cheat when making this inner product large by making either of those two sides too large. But you can put in very small values for alpha and beta. And just the fact that you have non-trivial inner product is automatically going to mean that you have geometric progress in getting to x star. So let's state that theorem and then prove it. And the nice thing about the proof of this theorem is that it's almost verbatim, the same proof that gradient descent works on strongly convex smooth functions. All this condition is, it's an, an abstraction of what makes that proof work. So let me tell you the theorem. So the theorem we're going to have is that um, if gt is alpha, beta, epsilon correlated, with x star, <coughs> then xt minus x star is at most 1 minus 2 alpha eta to the t, x0 minus x star plus epsilon over alpha. So this correlated notion also has some additive slack that we allow some additive slack epsilon. So in all tangentization, it really won't make sense to think about making geometric progress arbitrarily far. We'll only make geometric progress up to a point when we're extremely close to the right answer. Uh, we'll see why that actually comes up later, but we have this extra epsilon over alpha type of slack here, which accounts for the slack we have in the correlated definition. But then we're going to have the same type of property that we have geometric decay. Uh, this will be for for any eta at most two beta. So this will be our thing. Any questions about this? All right, let's prove it. There's really only one thing you can do in uh, you know, analyzing gradient descent. You plug in what your update rule is, and you just try and use inequalities until you run out of them. So let's do that. I mean, I guess there's a little bit more magic to it than that. But you know, all we're going to do is we're going to look at what, this pro you know, what our distance is, and we're going to relate it to what the distance was in the previous step. So the natural way to do this is just to plug in what xt plus 1 is. And lo and behold, we have rearranging the terms slightly with xt minus x star minus eta times gt, just because xt minus 
eta times gt is xt plus one, so that's fine. And now we can expand out this inner product, and all we end up getting is we get the old distance, xt minus x star squared minus two eta times the inner product between gt and xt minus x star plus eta squared gt squared. Just expanding it out. Right. Any questions? So now we can see where we're going to have to use this type of inequality about gt having non-trivial inner product with the direction we'd like to move in. You know, the key point for this definition is that you don't need to move in the direction actually of the gradient. You just need to somewhat move in roughly the right ballpark, and you still make progress. So it's kind of surprising the first time you see it, because when you're used to gradient descent, you know, all of your analysis is based on moving in quite a close direction to the gradient. But for optimization, we're really going to take advantage of the fact that you don't have to be moving in the same direction of the gradient. You just have to have some agreement. So, you know, what can we do now? So we can invoke our um, inequality, and we can upper bound this now using the definition of correlated with. And what we're going to get is that this is at most, you know, xt minus x star squared minus 2 eta. And I'm going to plug in something bigger now. So we can plug in something bigger with, um, oops, sorry, something smaller. So that we're subtracting off something smaller. So that makes sense, right? I'm just using the definition. OK, so now I can collect these terms. So I have minus 2 eta beta times gt squared. And I have eta squared times gt. But you know the key point is that we have that uh, eta squared gt squared is certainly at least two eta beta gt squared. This is just because in the theorem we've always chosen uh, eta. Oops. Write this inequality backwards. One second. Yeah, I think you want it the other way. So you can... Yeah, I mean, I just want to make sure that I'm using it correctly. So let me state it right now. We pulled it two beta. I think that's the right fix. So now when we have it here, we have eta squared gt squared. And we're subtracting off 2 eta beta gt squared. And I can just remove all of those terms and get an upper bound. So the entire thing is upper bounded by xt minus x star squared minus 2 eta times alpha xt minus star squared minus eta epsilon. So of course, this entire thing, I'm going to group together terms. So I end up getting 1 minus 2 eta alpha times xt minus <coughs> x star squared. And I still have this minus 2 eta. So now solving the recurrence. What I'm going to get at the end of the day is that xt 
minus x star squared. Well, we certainly have this geometric term. Now we also have to account for uh, this remaining additive minus two eta epsilon. Now each time plus plus two eta. Ah, thank you. Doing algebra on the board can be fun. Uh, so we have to account for this extra two eta epsilon term. But each time what we're going to be multiplying it by, you know, when we try to unwind this, is this, uh, you know, uh, geometric product. So we're going to get at the end of the day that it's two eta epsilon over two eta alpha, just by solving the recurrence. And lo and behold, we have our theorem. Right? Yeah. So I think your eta in the theorem was right, but this inequality on the line starting with but is the opposite direction that we want. I think so. If we have that eta squared, that thing is less than or equal to two eta, then we're then we're subtracting something that's right. negative, and that's that right. makes more sense. Thank you. Usually you need bounds on eta being small enough. Good. All right. Thank you. All right. Now I think we're good. Very simple theorem. Any other complaints with the proof? I think it's okay. Yeah? All right. Uh, so this automatically gives us some geometric convergence now up to this additive you know, epsilon over alpha term, which will be pretty negligible in the application we care about. But now we already have a target goal in mind, right? Because we have this iterative algorithm, which we're hoping can solve this non-convex optimization problem in the right generative model. And the way that we're going to do it is we're actually going to follow this plan. What we want to show is that in each step, that the direction we update, you know, when we choose, when we update alpha hat, we want to show that each one of its columns satisfies this alpha, beta, epsilon correlated with definition. And that's the reason we make progress. What I want to emphasize is that's exactly what we're going to be using the uh, stochastic properties of the model is to show that our update rule, we're going to rewrite its expectation. We'll be using a lot of sort of subconditioning arguments next time when we do it. But we're going to rewrite what that expectation is to show that it actually meets this condition. And then we'll automatically have that this rule really does work. So that's the plan. Just for posterity's sake, I'm going to state one more thing, which, you know, what I claimed is that this really isn't a new proof. This is uh, kind of just the usual proof of uh, gradient descent on smooth, strongly convex functions. So I'll just state this now as a claim, but uh, it's not too bad to verify it. Or you can look at Ubeck's book to, um, to look for you know, how he proves this inequality and uh, derive from it. So the claim that I want to state Actually, I'll call it a lemma because it's not completely obvious how to prove it. So the lemma I want to state is that if f is alpha prime strongly convex, and beta prime smooth, then the gradient, you know, if I set gt, the direction that I move in, to be equal to the gradient of f at xt is alpha prime over 2, 1 over 2, beta prime, 0, correlated with x star. So that's the key point. So if you look in this you know, notion of um, strongly convex and beta smooth, we get this geometric guarantee which depends on alpha divided by beta prime. Right? And here in this type of guarantee, we end up getting two alpha times eta. You're thinking of eta as being about beta here. So we're getting an alpha and a beta here. But that just comes from the fact that beta prime and beta are actually inversely related. And then you get the same type of geometric convergence immediately from this. So in fact, the proof of this theorem 
is really just a matter of that inequality for correlated with is when you prove this theorem about strongly convex smooth functions, well, the first thing you do is you prove that inequality with you know, these choice of uh, alpha and beta based on alpha prime and beta prime. And then you proceed through that proof. That's all you do. So this is a lemma. I mean, it does take a few lines to actually prove this. But the point is that it's really just an abstraction. That even though an approximate gradient descent, we won't in general be saying that this is the direction we move in, but that that inequality should still hold for potentially much worse parameters alpha and beta. But that's still enough to tell us that we make noticeable progress with each step. So I think that's one of the big differences in leveraging tools from convex optimization is that in learning, the functions we want to optimize are either known and non-convex, or they're unknown but convex. So that's one of the things which I would really love to sort of see more literature on, is that uh, last time when I taught this course, I taught alternate minimization for matrix completion. We're still going to do that. But what I always found funny was that the potential function that they use for showing that you make progress is something that you kind of pull out of thin air. You know, you want to prove that you're finding the right matrix and matrix completion, and you use like the principal angles between the subspace you found and the true subspace, and you show that it makes progress. So it would be kind of unfortunate if the intuition for uh, you know, altering minimization is always the same, that you want to do this, you know, fix one side and optimize over the other to deal with non-convexity. But each time the proof technique had to drastically change based on guessing the right potential function. Here, the right potential function is just going to come from approximate gradient descent. So I wonder if you know, many of the other proofs and all minimization can be abstracted using this type of framework. All right, so I think we'll stop here. Uh, once again, I have P sets, but this time I graded the uh, two that were turned in via email, finally. So uh, please pick them up. And uh, all right, see you Thursday. Uh, oh, that's a good question. By the way, so I'm going to post the second piece that I think on Thursday. And what we'll do is it'll encapsulate uh, some of sparse coding, but also mostly tensor, so some of sparse recovery, but mostly tensor decompositions and their applications. That'll probably be the last piece set, and then I'll start talking about final projects. So that'll be the more interesting part where I'll ask you guys to sort of team up and uh, you know, teach me something. It'll be fun. Yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest a reading list, but if you also have particular things you want to do that are related to the course, I'm more than happy to do that too. But you'll have to do like a final writing project about like four to six pages, just sort of abstract main ideas. But uh, you can either do it as a lit review or you can do it as like you know, talking about some new open problem and try and do some research. But uh, we'll chat about Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what was the second piece of code you do? Uh, probably in two weeks. Not two weeks. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Anchor, um, you said you were going to get a recommendation of papers or stuff for the project. Yes. So there's a kind of like a topic that I'm particularly interested that's in. That's fine too. Can I ask you, maybe yes. you have recommendations for me? Yep. If you, that's a good suggestion. So I'll talk more about this later. But if you have a particular idea, you should come talk to me before okay. just doing it. Yeah. Because I may have some suggestions about what things to do that are more you know, relevant than others. Yeah. But great if you have your own suggestion. Just uh, hash out the details with me about what actually you want to do. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Awesome. Um, question. So, yep. uh, about the uh, gradient descent. So, in, in practice, people don't use gradient descent, but they use the momentum method, right? Are there any theoretical guarantees that like show the momentum in R methods are better? What moment methods? The momentum methods. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Is um, you know, this type of convergence rate, you know, is not optimal. Like, yeah. really, you should use a you know accelerated gradient descent. Yeah. One of the simplest ways to think about this is trying to minimize a quadratic function on a matrix. Mm -hmm. That if you know gradient descent is the analog of the power method. Power. Yeah. So, 
Well, this one's a good thing to know is, you know, imagine I want to try and minimize um, the norm of A times X such that, you know, X has unit norm. Okay. Right? Or maximize it, let's say, for simplicity. And let's assume that it's top, you know, let's assume this is a symmetric matrix mm -hmm. and that its top eigenvalue is 1 and that all the other eigenvalues are bounded away from 1. Okay. Right? Uh, in absolute value, right? So we have, you know, if you look at the spectrum, we have, you know, one point at 1, at plus 1, mm -hmm. and then we have a bunch of other stuff that's somewhere in here, right? Okay. And what you do is you set, you know, xt equal to a to the t times x, 0, where you randomly guess x to be an arbitrary unit vector. Okay. Now, based on the eigen decomposition of a, what's going to happen is that this guy's component on the largest direction goes up like lambda 1 to the t. So it actually okay. stays the same. But all the other things, lambda 2 to the t, decays exponentially to 0. Okay. Right? So this is a simple power method rule for finding the top eigen you know, vector. Okay. Uh, you can even find the eigen value this way. But if you think about it, what's actually going on is that you have this polynomial in X, which is X to the T. And this polynomial is 1 at 1 and is small here. Yeah. And what you're relying on is that that polynomial is shrinking all of the things which are not the top eigenvalue. That's just an abstraction of the proof. Okay, of that. Yes. But there are things which do better than this, like there's the Chebyshev polynomial. Mm -hmm. So the Chebyshev polynomial is 1 at the origin, and it's the answer to the extremal question of if I give you a bound here, you know, on this region, yep. you know, 1 to, you know, R, and I want you to minimize the max value, absolute value inside here, mm -hmm. subject to the constraint that you're at 1, it's achieved by scale Chebyshev polynomial. Okay. And what that really looks like is instead you're choosing xd to be equal to some polynomial in A times x0. Mm -hmm. Because that's the polynomial that acts on its spectrum, right? Gotcha, okay. So this is actually, if you work it out, accelerated gradient descent, I claim, is the same improvement on gradient descent as, the Chebyshev. as Chebyshev is there. That's not to say that actually accelerated gradient descent is a much deeper statement. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, but I think the intuition is clearer in matrix case. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to minimize some convex function, the fact that you can do as well as if it were a matrix mm -hmm. is the magic of accelerated gradient descent. But the fact that momentum terms help you is already known here. So there's a way that you can generate the Chebyshev polynomials through a recurrence, where the, the T of the Chebyshev polynomial is some particular linear combination of the T minus first and the T minus second. That's because it's an orthogonal polynomial, but that's explicitly the momentum term. Is you don't just keep track of where you are, you keep track of where you came from. So there's actually an analog that the way that you build up Chebyshev polynomials through a recurrence is actually completely the same as how you build up momentum oh, terms. Yeah. It's just that Nesterov's proof is like an abstraction mm -hmm. of the matrix case. And I think it's much easier to understand why it works in the matrix case. Because it's, so, so, it's, so those are called power methods, right? Yeah, power methods. So power actually, methods. there's a guy who's giving a talk on Friday, not about these things. Uh -huh. But he has a fantastic uh, blog post about uh, the analogs between gradient descent uh -huh. and power method. Okay. Versus acceler you know, power method versus gradient descent, mm -hmm. and uh, as the analogs versus um, length source iteration and accelerated gradient descent. Okay. So I highly recommend checking out his blog. Uh, but how are you, how are, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Okay. Um, but the other thing to point out is that in learning, I mean, I've thought about this question about whether you should incorporate momentum terms. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think momentum terms are too um, aggressive. Okay. So when you actually have the gradient, then you yeah. can do these things. Yeah. But there's a sense in which, like, so Moritz even has a 